Glory to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Welcome to Oraho the Way, an online outreach ministry to disseminate the love of triune God through the life and witness of the Syriac Orthodox Church. Oraho the Way is presenting a tribute to the flute of the Holy Spirit, Malfono Mor Jacob of Saruk. We are heeding the call of our patriarch, Moran Mor Ignatius Afrem II, and joining the Holy Church across the globe and with other churches with Syriac tradition and cherishing the Syriac legacy in commemorating this Jubilee year. And today we are honored to announce that we have a great speaker for this program, Reverend Father Dr. Jacob Joseph. He is an Associate Professor of Christian Mission at Holy Transfiguration College, Agora University, and a lecturer at St. Athanasius College, University of Divinity, Melbourne, and teaches courses on Orthodox mission, contextual theology, Syria Christianity, church history, and Indian 
contextual theology. And today, Achen will be talking about uh, his lecture is titled as More Jacob of Saruk, Embracing the Poor. And you will have the opportunity to interact with Achen uh, as he is through with the lecture. Without any delay, let me welcome Reverend Father Dr. Jacob Joseph. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Renchen Matthew. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Once again, thank you, Reverend Matthew Achen, for this wonderful opportunity. It, is, it gives me immense of joy to be a part of the, this study group, particularly studying the life and contribution of Maud Jacob of Serug, the flute of the Holy Spirit. And I'm humbled myself that Orho, the way our team extended the special time for me to talk about an important area of Maud Jacob's writings and also spirituality. And therefore, first of all, I just wish to thank all the team members of Orho and especially other doctor, Matthew. The study on the social questions in the writings of Maud Jacob of Serug is an extra demand from scholars. The theme such as social concerns or concerns to the poor seem not to be the central focus of Maud Jacob of Serug as we read the scholars of Maud Jacob. However, such themes can be found subtly in most of his writings, which has not been properly e extracted. In this presentation, an attempt is made to introduce a social lens of Maud Jacob by reading his love for the poor. This paper does not claim to dwell into the entire corpuses of Maud Jacob of Serug to extract the social themes that Maud Jacob had produced in its entirety. The primary emphasis of this paper, titled Maud Jacob of Serug, Embracing the Poor, is to see how Maud Jacob had treated the poor theologically and its direct response to our contemporary social fabric. The paper does not hide the dilemma before us on how to understand early church teachers and their understanding of the people labeled as the margins of the society. Or differently stated, how the early teachers treated people who fall into the category of poor, widows and socially and economically marginalized communities with their social involvement and perspectives are yet to be studied systematically. In short, this presentation will address the way more Jacob of Serug imagined the kingdom of God experience by analyzing the act of embracing the poor, considering embrace as a Christological category that connects with the poor and the needy, and how the poor perhaps shapes a new theological type that is in the image of God, and such image becomes a source for eternal life. Mo Jacob, according to D. H. Connolly, was a gentle and studious bishop of Batnan, chief city of Serug, a district which lay a little to the east of the river Euphrates and southwest Edessa was born at the village of Katam on the Euphrates in the year 451 AD. As Jacob's scholars agree upon that the early vocation of Mo Jacob was to visit the rural villages of Serug, more than the capital city of Batnan, for the episcopate, and there he might have encountered the real life of poverty and the suffering of the ordinary people. Of his numerous writings on various themes, 
and variety of subjects as his holiness afrim barsum refers to it as in his book the scattered pearls a history of syriac literature and sciences include topics such as faith goodness atonement resurrection glory food praise to the blessed virgin mary prophets apostles and martyrs in most of the theme these themes more jacob develops a necessity for praxis or probably practice of those theology in our daily lives among the faithful his call for the practice of what is preached love of the poor or love for the poor becomes the theme for today's presentation this theme is found in volume 2 of father paul bedjan collection of saint jacob's homilies the name of the homily is love of the poor sebastian brook the well known syriac scholar translated love of the poor into english and the unpublished version is available for academic purposes we will heavily depend on this version for today's presentation when this paper changes its title from love of the poor to embracing the poor the author imagines that the word embrace which is in syriac nafik takes a christological turn this christological interpretation can be seen from saint jacob's typological approach to the old testament and direct understanding of new testament texts for example when he deals with the question of the poor first he places christ the one who is being embraced poverty voluntarily which is reflected according to him in the old testament and in the new testament books in his homely love of the poor more jacob explicitly advocates his understanding of god in christ and christ directly is identified with the poor so what are those typological or christological passages that we find in his writings some of the examples as follows the need to bring christ as poor is referred to in the following passages when he writes about follow the model of the widow who gave her two pennies luke chapter 21 2 and when sacchias the tax collector knew that christ is the love of poverty began and with which he began to love the poor luke chapter 19 8 and when he says you cannot serve two masters meaning both god and mammon luke chapter 16 13 or matthew 6 12 and when J- more jacob explains about the needy are the good soil in the story of the sowing of the seed and even luke chapter 16 23 when he explains about lazarus and rich man all these explanations directs us towards Christ the poor and then he brings the typology from the old testament that the, those passages genesis 188 where the guest at the house of abraham and the suffering vision of isaiah's vision on suffering isaiah chapter 53 verse verses 4 and 6 and sira talking about giving to the poor is giving to god all these portions depict the direct connection to the christological nature that more jacobs envisions from the old testament and then the direct connections that again he makes in the new testament models which is he talks about the christological references matthew 25 36 when you visit one at the jail you are visiting christ and more jacob jacob continues serving the poor receiving the life which means that life is christ and matthew 8:20 when he says follow christ who identified poverty meaning you are asked to follow the poor because christ became poor and as paul explains according to more jacob in second corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 
God who was rich yet he became poor and Ephesians chapter 4 32 be kind compassionate and forgive to imitate Christ he means that these are all talking about the relationship between Christ and the poor what was the primary reason for for more jacob to begin to write about the poor one of the main th- theories behind this attempt could be the common interest of christian leaders shown in his time to develop the love of the poor or love for the poor on christian leadership and their responses to poor and the rich between the years 380 300 to 600 AD of the roman empire both byzantine and oriental leaders were considered a virtuous act in w radel and w e comes edited and translated book on the canons 14 of pseudo athenaeus the author narrates the importance of love of the poor in the late roman empire according to canon 14 a christian bishop takes up the guardian of poor or the love lover of the poor par excellence a bishop who loves the poor the same is rich and and his city and region shall be honored this benevolent act is expected not only from the bishop but from all people of all category peter brown's seminal work poverty and leadership in the later roman empire provides us with a good scholarship in this regard brown one of the very significant scholars who studied and studies in the area of the early christianity argues that to be a lover of the poor became public virtue in roman in the roman world this was an was expected virtue from rich people Christian leaders and Roman authorities including the emperor codex of justinius agrees with this claim in p kruger's edited version of codex justinius 1.2.12 explains as emperors namely valentines 3rd and marcian who ruled the west and the east of the roman empire in 451 declared that it is a feature of a human nature a human rule to look after the interest of the destitute and to ensure that the poor do not go without food the modern archaeological evidences also show us that the ancient greek or roman world periodically experienced utter poverty and famine where the leaders of the society urged the rich to help the poor The best book that we can read in this regard is the scholarship from Richard Horsley. His two monographs namely Christian Origins a people's history of Christianity volume 1 and Jesus and Empire the kingdom of God and the new world order narrate the significant amount of data that brings us brings to us the light of how Roman world treated the poor in spite of the call for their support. This is true while we read people's social lives depicted in the Old and the New Testament. A category of people in the villages as narrated in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, were in utter poverty for many reasons. If you turn to the beginning of the New Testament writings, one would see that Augustus Caesar, King Herod, King of Judea, began constructing cities in the Galilean provinces. recruiting laborers from the villages an important study in this area is done by warren carter in his work which is published titled matthew and margins a socio political and religious reading many such studies testify the king that king herod followed bonded labor system no wonder to see the increase amount of poverty in the roman world it means according to carter that most of the crowd who followed christ was composed of poor and the people of heavy laden sick and weary and so on and so forth the passages mentioned in the love of the poor by mor jacob of serug are also the best examples for understanding the life of the poor 
in the biblical times. Having explained the common trends of more Jacob's time to develop love of the poor, we must also ponder over whether more Jacob of Seru considered his love towards the poor just as a stereotype urge of the Christian or state leaders of his time. However, his homely love of the poor clearly explains that he develops his passion towards the poor mainly because of his Christological confession. This conviction brings new vistas of interpretation of the poor and Christ advocating his audience to create a love for the poor with a sense of theological urgency. In general, Jacob's, St. Jacob's Christology is not understood in this way. One of the pioneering and seminal works finding Jacob's Christology is Robert C. Chestnut's Three Monophysite Christologies, Severus of Antioch, Philoxenus of Marburg, and Jacob Husserl. In this work, though it is controversial and debatable to accept the term monophysite and Jacob's attachment to Gnosticism, Chestnut alludes to Jacob's Christology with a different note than St. Severius and Morphilexinus. According to Chestnut, Jacob of Serug's theory of knowledge has distinct and Gnosticizing tendencies which produce a very different picture of Christ. He continues, a quote, Jacob's thought is far more mythological or symbolic, far closer to the thought world in which Gnosticism flourished than to the world of Greek philosophy and theology. When producing the different images that Christ held in Jacob's writing, Chestnut limits only with the titles related to mythological system, the doctrinal question of oneness of Christ and mixture, the image of servant, the secret Jesus, and the image of chariot of his Ezekiel. In none of these themes, Chestnut presents Jesus as poor. The criticism that Chestnut, Chestnut must face here is his less tendency to push the theme of the image of servant to bring about Jacob's imagination of placing Jesus within the context of poverty and the social status of marginality or people who are categorized as poor due to their socio-economic conditions. In short, Chestnut's, Chestnut's interest to explain Christ in the uh, mythological approach by discussing the first and second Adam is again questionable within the framework of the love of the poor because he limits this theme even within the myth mythological approach. It is in this context we need to look at how more Jacob places Christ in the image of the poor, reading through his homely love of the poor. Christ as the poor, the kingdom of God. This is the next title I have put here. Christ as the poor and kingdom of God. The most important image of Jesus that Mo Jacob extracted for this theme is the suffering of Jesus. Mo Jacob writes, Jesus bore our sufferings and was smitten with our sicknesses. Just as Isaiah wrote concerning him in Isaiah 53, 4. For your sake, he was made a beggar in the streets, in hunger and needed among, along with the poor in this world. To his listeners, he wanted to emphasize a figure of Jesus that equates the self-emptying figure which identifies with the poor. By quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Mo Jacob writes, He who is rich, has lowered himself to become a debtor, seeing that he seeks to scatter his riches in all sorts of ways. He is hidden and exalted high above all the ranks of heavenly beings. But when a poor person stand, stands at the door, you see him, which means you see Christ. More Jacob emphasizes and says that Jesus is poor, 
and takes a different form of poverty. But to see Jesus poor, you need the eye of faith. He exalts, if you want to see Jesus the poor, open your luminous eyes of faith that does not doubt with the sick, with those in distress, with those who mourn, with the needy, with the hungered, the buffeted and afflicted. He is confined in prison. Go and visit him, Amen, with the prisoners, as mentioned in St. Matthew chapter 25, verse 36. He whom the cherubims convey on their backs with trembling lights, smitten on the bed of sickness, Amen, with the sick. Every poor person is a disguised form of Christ. And that is the challenging change, a difference that we have seen in Jacob of Sarai. So according to St. Mord Jacob, they are just like the guests who visited Abraham, mentioned in Genesis chapter 18, verse 8, to fulfill his typological interpretation. Mord Jacob does not want to keep this just as a theory. A theological category or an idea of Christian interpretation of the poor. Instead, he observes this as a practical reflection of Christian faith. And therefore, for Jacob, every person who begs for bread before you seem to be the image, image of Christ. Christ is God, comes before you as a beggar. More Jacob, Jacob writes, he at whose fierce heat the seraphs of fire cover their faces is here going around in the person of the poor, begging bread from you. He before whom the cherubim of fire trembles in his exalted sphere are here going around with the beggars from house to house. Jacob's this interpretation gives scope to the rich as well to enter in the kingdom of God. He advises the rich people to share their resources so that along with the poor, the rich also inherit the kingdom. The next topic is justice, sacramental bread and the poor. Justice, sacramental bread and the poor. When the poor knock, do not tell them the Lord will give. Those words are vain, and they bring no answer to you. Instead, give, and then you may say, the Lord provides. For the poor knows better than you that God provides. This is a liturgical uh, sentence. It is found in great length. The prayer recited on Thursday, ninth hour. He uses metaphorical language for denoting both the poor and the rich here. For Saint Jacob, the poor are like the good soil, as I said in the mentioned above. To see the seed, what is the seed here for more Jacob? It is the seed of justice. Here, justice is equated as Christ Himself. Why does more Jacob make such a revolutionary step? He perceives that the buffeted, the hungry, and the afflicted are like fields. Do not be slow in casting your seed on this good soil. By taking care of the marginalized ones, the rich are exhibiting their character of Christ, and, and that character must be shown through caring for the poor in their needs. For a hungry it will be a piece of bread, whatever the little things you do, which will exist as a good seed sown in the ground. These pieces of bread that you give to a person in need will gather in shelves of life in the land above. Your gift may be tiny when it is given, yet it will prepare for you a table of blessings along with Abraham as it is found in Luke chapter 16, 23. So therefore, remember that in a lowly and despised guise, he has come to visit you, so that when you fill his belly, you will find the bread of life. 
and every helping hand therefore is like sharing the sacramental bread more jacob interprets this sacramental mystery and love for the poor very powerfully he writes i quote he has given you his own body stretch out your hands and give him bread for he is hungry you drink his blood take up and give him to drink for he is perch parched he gave you radiance and splendor to put on from the baptismal water do not fob him of with miserable worn out clothing and what are these connections that we make between the bread and justice or justice and bread the sacramental bread this practical message cautions each of his listeners that the same christ is also depicted as god of justice so the connection between justice and sacramental bread is making more on a personified level when one fails to practically respond to the face of christ in the poor elsewhere more jacob writes it is a common duty to have mercy upon one's fellow human being if he does not have pity he will be punished by justice so what is the justice justice is christ so justice is mentioned as christ so christ and his sacramental bread are to be shared the rich having gold should know that he has been made a steward manages his possession and that is the reason why we continue in our great lent prayers wednesday morning prayer it writes and reads like this here the word justice or kinuso is used as a personified noun justice stands for christ meaning justice is christ himself this exaltation of more jacob echoes in our churches every year through our liturgical singing attaching each one of us in his audience group for him the purpose of this repeated hearing of his message will be the experience of the kingdom of god irrespective of your status rich or poor the next title is eschatological life an experience of the embrace of the poor eschatological life an experience of the embrace of the poor according to more jacob of cerro the aim of extending a hand to the poor and the needy is more with a purpose of eschatological or eternal life for him the wealth that spoils the entire human goal of eternal life creates a world of evil so he intends to bring both the rich and the poor into kingdom by sharing the world's resources with the poor both the rich and the poor entails entering into the kingdom of god because every resource that the rich hold is the resource of god he explains this idea by saying give from what is yours not that you are giving from what belongs to you for you have nothing of your own to offer him it is he who provides for you to satisfy this claim more jacob provides various biblical interpretations that widow who had in her house with two small coins until she produced them and gave the way he did not reside with her next one is simon head of the disciples only had a small net the moment he cast it away he followed the son of god the apostles did not possess anything by fish net on earth they left them behind and now they are rich and possesses the kingdom sakias the tax collector had a house filled with wealth but when christ entered to the entertained there and uh, to be entertained there he straight away divided it up there was nothing in his house that sakias did not distribute since he saw that his lord was a low was a lover of poverty he does not enter a house where he sees gold since it is it has grabbed and taken his place and he is not wanted gold has not got has got and become 
master wherever it is and if someone some other master enters he despises and insults him you cannot serve with all your strength two masters god and mammon together one will be honored the other despised because you are not capable of repaying both equally with a single honor to more jacob of seru considering the poor and place of jesus and acting accordingly would extend the possibility of inheriting the kingdom of god or eschatological or eternal life this is why more jacob writes that in the person of poor he is requesting you so that by all sorts of means he may cause you to acquire the kingdom for the rich it is difficult to experience since they hold on the wealth but more jacob does not stop their possibilities to inherit the kingdom nonetheless the kingdom of god for the poor is surely as they manifest the face of christ it is almost like st augustine's understanding of the option for the poor as a moral obligation for those who want to spread not only justice but love or st gregory the great's reinforcement of this moral obligation stating when we attend to the needs of those in want we give them what is their theirs not ours more than performing works of mercy we are paying a debt of justice or even like the words of gustavo gutierrez the liberation theologian when he says god's preferential option for the poor conclusion in conclusion more jacob's imagination of christ as the poor and responding to the needs of the poor as a means of experiencing the kingdom of god and thereby the eternal life through the participation of bread of life which is a challenging depiction of christology for our times so embracing the poor is a christological act and a category christ stands for embracing the poverty of the whole world by which according to say more jacob on the one hand christ himself identifies with the poor and extends his hands to uplift the poor of the world to be able to enjoy the eternal life in today's context poverty brokenness weariness weariness and bondedness prevail in all human life fields namely religious cultural economic ecological gender etc here more jacob's voice is still not only a prophetic theory a practice known for our daily life perhaps as more jacob imagines christ as the poor embracing the poor let us identify ourselves with those who imagined christ in the poor category of today's life along with their slogan like christ as dalit christ is black Christ is minju may god help us to understand and experience the embracing nature of poor so that we will experience a christological category of more jacobs teaching to be able to serve the poor and make this world a better place thank you thank you hn for this wonderful presentation um well uh it's non and you know you try to emphasize it's not just a love of poor it's the care for the poor uh so the praxis side of the uh the the understanding is what actually matters and even with that you know th- there is still hope even the rich can enter the kingdom of god and in you know, all through the um the bosoms of um great land um saint jacob is calling out the rich and what they need to do at the time of uh, great land uh to enter the kingdom of god so many times we think that orthodox is just focusing on the doxa side the worship side but you know saint jacob is reminding us it's not just the doxa it's not just the worship it is the praxis uh is actually you know what matters or maybe i would say an intersection of the orthodoxia and orthopraxis is what matters 
uh, in the contemporary world. Would you like to reflect upon that? I mean, you know, it's a summary of your presentation as well. Thank you, um, Father Matthew, for uh, concising my talk. Uh, I think one of the things that fascinates me with uh, regard to reading more uh, Jacob of Serug is to see how, particularly this homely, homely of love, the poor, is that how uh, the entire discussion of the poor and the needy and the weary is taken into the into the uh, into the category of theology and Christology. So most of the time. Uh, when you look at uh, the whole idea of uh, Christological interpretation, on the one hand, we lose the eminence of, of its nature, or how do we look at Christology in our day-to-day our -day life. And sometimes we also see the, the opposite side of it. We, we overemphasize eminence, but we don't take care of what is happening with the transcendent. And uh, more, uh, Jacob of Serug uh, is very fairly uh, and very uh, carefully uh, creating a, a system of theology whereby he brings this uh, to understanding of not only uh, the idea of the praxis, but also the confessing the faith. And not only the confessing the faith, but also the idea of praxis. And therefore, he went at, uh, even uh, at the extent of saying Jesus is poor. Now it is a very challenge, though this is a very simple sentence for us, uh, but it is a very challenging sentence for our times when we continue to interpret the same, the nature of poor into our day-to-day -day category of human life. As I can, as I, I concluded in my talk, that in the uh, Black American context, people say. Jesus is black. And uh, we know that in the Asian context, people say Jesus is Minjum. Uh, or in the Indian context, even uh, there were theologians, there are theologians, they would say Christ is Dalit. And sometimes when we hear this statement, we are a little bit uh, reluctant to accept their theology, but we are very happy to accept Maud Jacob's interpretation of Jesus as poor. So taking that poor as a category and understanding uh, the theology uh, behind it, particularly in the view of uh, Christ as the poor, it is, he is not only identified in the New Testamental text, but bringing those uh, typological arguments starting from the very Moses' topics or, or texts uh, where uh, he starts from Genesis, where how uh, how the uh, Abraham experienced his visitors and how he handled the people or those who came to them, to him, were poor and the needy and treated them as a God category. And all the way from there until uh, his, Jesus' own words, bringing uh, his nature of interacting with the poor. And probably this is where, again, some of those statements that we are not happy to listen to, uh, if I if I quote again um, Guterres, that God's preferential option for the poor, is been there the solid theme even to, even while we read our fathers. But uh, unfortunately, when we uh, extract the theology from our early fathers, we are more uh, fascinated to look at. Uh, the transcendental side of their interpretation, uh, and not much with uh, uh, with the with the day-to-day -day, uh, experiences that that are connected within their their writings, and I believe that is my major criticism to Chestnut, where he has very uh, readily brought out the concept of the servant of God, Jesus as the servant of God, but with if, if you read that book, Three Monophysoid Christologies, uh, where you will see that only one sentence, he, he refers to this statement uh, that Jesus is referred to as uh, the, the, uh, the servant of Christ or the servant. But immediately 
he falls into the same category of interpretation of a mythology where he brings the adam first adam and the second adam it, i mean it is absolutely uh, right it is absolutely good and that is the strong part of a theology but at the same time we must also push ourselves to see how these categories are connected to the servanthood of christ and that becomes a, a very uh, uh, or an important important aspect uh, of of type of understanding of christ in our today's context where uh, the imminence of christ is is uh, is an important uh, 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 discussional point i think this this is where i believe uh, for me more jacob of sarugus giving much hope Uh, to uh, uh, to us in today's world along with the solid uh, christological uh, method and even typos that is presented in his all other uh, uh, confessions and i think that that's what i wanted to uh, convey uh, in, in into this uh, particular presentation right um, so jacob of sarug never Uh, looks at the incarnation event as a historical event it's it's an ongoing event so uh yeah. so that yeah. incarnation that uh, embracing christ embrace everyone that's that's how uh, he was embracing uh, men he was embracing every every creation so that's how he, he you know we also need to embrace um each other and you know embrace uh, not just the poor but the entire creation may be uh, in a wider perspective as well and this incarnation even has to continue in its fullness uh, so this is how jacob of saruk uh, views uh, this historical things many times you know we just go back and view that and study that as literature or study uh, many things or the the whole corpus of um, the 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 patristic literature Uh, as uh, you know uh, just look at that without any 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 contextual uh, taking any any context or reading uh, with the eyes of, or you know looking uh, or reading the uh, you know the fathers through the lens of our own experiences our own context and they developed this divine um theology or reflections on the scripture based on the context based on their life experiences even saint jacob you know he, he you know he was born at the time i think in the same year the Cal, the the uh, i mean you know so there are a lot of heresies and many many things are reflecting as response to the ongoing heresies and you know so jacob of sarug is giving a lot of hope for us uh, especially achan you are um, you know you are more into the contextual um side of theology and you know the mission and practical aspects of theology and you know without that what we are doing is going to be a, a sterile exercise and you know um so we are not growing or you know we are not transforming we are not becoming human in jacob's own words and thank you so much uh, for this wonderful presentation uh so if you have any other final thoughts um, just please reflect and then conclude with a benediction uh thank you achan for those concluding uh, or, uh remarks uh, my prayer is uh, is that we must take our our early teachers church fathers and mothers very seriously and in our today's context i think it is very much needed uh for our practical life uh and i think it demands more uh, vigorous reading rigorous interpretation and and going deep into their own uh, confessions uh not just to keep only a category of a geography just it it is important it is important to 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 acknowledge and also to cherish our past and our our entire uh, world of our desert fathers or church fathers or uh, anti nice and post nice in fathers and their contributions and that's what we are today but at the same time we need to 
to take them into a, into our own lives and contexts if i put it more in a methodological manner i think i have i've explained it elsewhere and even in my writings i've i've made i made it clear uh, that we had a tendency even in the modern orthodox theologies or theological writers um, uh, had a tendency to just cut and paste our church fathers you know just go back to the 6th century 4th century and get a quote and then you know use it for today rather than allowing them to speak for us today so that is more important and that's the reason why i hope you remember that in my previous lecture in the same forum i said fathers, fathers are not dead fathers are not dead and that's my 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 creed <laughs> my my dictum fathers are not dead their voices can be heard even today but the the most important thing thing is that you need a voice a, a practical voice to be heard and for which you you should become a father or a mother today and allow them to uh, uh, to make a polyphonic approach uh, to the world so that they will speak uh, on the context definitely they will allow us to understand what is in their mind without losing their doctrinal position and so that's the most important they the foundation the fundamental fact is the doctrinal position that you can't change but that doctrinal position would allow us to think further and go beyond and and see today's con- because contexts are changing ever changing uh, contexts and where you need voices and you need support from our church fathers and mothers and that is the most important thing that we need to take up today and i think i i i conclude i would also uh, uh borrow the words of uh, uh bishop calisto spear uh very recently when he was making a uh, a critique on uh, the methodological uh, approach of george florowski on uh, the new patristic synthesis uh, he was making a statement that we have been uh, uh, taking up our early fathers and mothers on more on the uh, level of praising our history but now we must also know why they wrote those uh, their literatures for the humans existing today so or maybe the the, the world existing today and therefore he makes a very controversial statement that now it is the time for us to change from change our categories from top to bottom and look at human beings and look at the creation where you need to really understand what is the meaning of creation i think that makes a very solid uh, uh, step uh, for orthodox theologians to contribute in today's world and i think i i strongly believe uh, bishop uh, where is giving a very good direction to us that god speaks to us and even during this christmas season or time of uh, uh, advent and we are going to celebrate uh, the birth of christ uh, next week i think we must really understand why did god become uh, uh, you know come to this earth and become a human being and what is the the need for that and what is the what is more relevant for us to understand the world that god said i i mean it is after every creation he said it is good or john chapter 3 verse 16 he says god so loved the world and what is that world and when we when we understand that god so loved the world we must also understand even more jacob of serov in the same uh, i think i in uh, in another homely tamar i believe uh, he says uh, the world is evil so he 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 makes a category between the evil of the world and the world that god has seen good you know so this is something very important for us to continue to grapple with and i think uh, the particularly the orthodox theologians must uh, dwell into or get into this pool of understanding of our fathers and fathers are not dead take them very seriously and allow them to speak today that is my my uh, final word for this group uh, who are, who are listening to to me today and thank you so much all my listeners and all those who are loving uh, the uh, uraho the way and thank you father dr brenton matthew for having given me this opportunity though i'm a part of this whole process of encouraging the stock to everyone but uh, this space is more i believe that a blessed space through which we are uh, disseminating as you said at the beginning disseminating uh, god's uh, word uh, through the eyes and lens of our early fathers and orthodoxy 
and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to you, all of all of you, and also do pray for me as well. Uh, thank you so much, Achen. Um, uh, thank you, all viewers, uh, all, all those who are listening. Um, and Achen, uh, please conclude with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one, now and forever. Amen. Thank you thank once you. again, um, all viewers. Thank you, um, Achen. Thank you. Bless everyone. All glory to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.